prepared to tell them. Okay, this is, thank you. This is a, a, a clip okay. from the okay. yeah. movie Yield Bit and Fiddle, in which Molly Peacock sings Yield Bit and Fiddle. Yeah, I'm sorry, I kind of got it off to a slightly different place there. Mm -hmm. Um, no, this is good. Mm -hmm. She says, Does it fail? Oh, does it not fail? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Years. 
and may you have not joy just being with him. I'm afraid I can't talk about myself because for these last three years I have been fighting Bell's palsy about which only Bubby, my grandmother, used to say you shouldn't know from it. So not working for three years has taught me to accept the bad and the good and all my friends pray with me to somehow get back to myself and begin working again and maybe. Your letter and your dad's remarks do not fear to grow old. Many are denied the privilege makes me realize how lucky I am to have friends like you. May blessings and love, and from now on only, may you have blessings and love. Shalom, peace, love, Molly Peacock. So I'm gonna put this over here. And you can all look at it later. This reply from Molly Pecan was written three days after her 87th birthday. Molly was born on Broom Street in Lower Manhattan on June 1, 1898, but lived in Philadelphia most of her life. Her <coughs> mother, Clara Ostrov, was born in Rezgistov in Russia, the fifth of 11 children. Thank you. Her father, Louis Pierre Kuhn, was not admired by Molly's grandmother. He had a view of the world which included a great classical education for men. This precluded him from working to support his family. He spent his time studying, you know, God will provide. <laughs> Molly's mother, Clara, was an excellent seamstress and her father brought home piecework from the local sweatshops for her to sew. When Clara became pregnant, Lewis decided that his son, too, would have a great classical education. But as Molly says in her family biography, so laugh a little, I ruined all his plans. <laughs> Lewis had declared he wouldn't speak to his wife ever again if she had a daughter. <laughs> Molly's, tell you. Molly's grandmother said, he stood and stared down at Molly, sleeping in her cradle, and said directly to Molly, it's nothing personal. You, you understand? I don't hold you responsible. <laughs> Thanks a lot. He was true to his word and didn't speak to Clara for a whole year. And Molly says he did eventually give Mama another chance. <coughs> Molly said, but my mother couldn't seem to live up to what was expected of her. She promptly produced my sister Helen. <laughs> The birth of Molly's sister three years later prompted Louis Piecoon to walk out on the family, what a gun, and take a room in a boarding house. Molly's mother now had become a businesswoman. She hung a shingle on her door reading Clara Piecoon, Seamstress. It was at this point Molly's link to show business began. Her mother took in work on costumes for local theaters. Eventually, her costume work became so much that she abandoned her other sewing to do costuming full time. Molly says, from wardrobe mistress to stage mother was inevitable. There were parts for children, and any children in, near, or around the theater were pressed into service. At age five, Molly made her theatrical debut at a local theater's amateur night. For this, her mother sewed her a special costume. On the trolley ride to the theater, a man questioned such a fancy dress on such a little girl. Go ahead, Malkala, show him. Get up and sing, said yeah. Molly's mother. Molly sang. The doubting man was so impressed that he passed the hat around the trolley. <laughs> of course, Molly won the amateur contest, <laughs> the prize being a $5 gold piece. That was a lot of money. Between this, the trolley money, and the money thrown up on the stage, <coughs> Molly collected $10. In 1903, this was more than many people earned in a week. It was a miracle, as Molly's grandmother said. <coughs> At the age of six, <coughs> she made her first appearance in Philadelphia under the management of Mike Tomaszewski, who happens to be Michael Tilson Thomas's, was it? His uncle or his grandfather? Michael. Anyway, 
but somebody's going to know this. But even though she appeared nightly in the theater, she had to go to school every day. Because she was small, Molly's teacher at the Northern Liberty School in Philadelphia, Miss Apple, thought she might not be getting enough to eat. To Miss, a to Miss Apple, I was an example, Molly says. She was not impressed with the fact that I was on the stage making 50 cents a night. One day, the teacher sent for Molly's grandmother to discuss her nutrition. Her grandmother came and was upset at Miss Apple's inquiry as to whether Molly was getting enough food. Her grandmother said, she eats what everybody else eats. Well, it's just that I'm wondering if Molly is getting a balanced diet. Do you give her enough vegetables? In my house, there is sauerkraut and pickles on the table every day. And it's good, believe me, I make it myself. Well, I was referring to green vegetables, Miss Apple said pointedly. What's the matter, Molly's Bobby asked in bewilderment. Pickles ain't green? <laughs> <laughs> well, Molly made it through the pickle inquisition to her sophomore year of William Penn High School 1912-1913. All this time she was performing locally in Philadelphia. At 15, she performed the role of Topsy in Uncle Tom's Cabin in Yiddish and English. <laughs> she then joined a vaudeville act called The Four Seasons, which toured the United States. Molly played Winter because she could do a Russian dance and also because she was the only one with a Russian costume. <laughs> Eventually, they wound up in Boston. The influenza epidemic of 1918 had closed all the English theaters, and the four seasons folded nimbly. At this point, Molly decided to go home. Knowing some actors at the Grand Opera House, a Yiddish theater, Molly went there to borrow car fare home to Philadelphia. By the way, um, actor Paul Muni, then known as Muni Weisenfreund, was playing there at the time. She didn't get any money, but Molly got a job. Mm -hmm. The manager of the theater, Yonko Kalish, needed a replacement, someone that could sing and dance, and he hired Molly on the spot. Soon after, they became engaged on the stage where they met the Grand Opera Theater. 1,500 people in the audience were invited to stay and celebrate the engagement. Mm -hmm. They were married on June 29, 1919, when Molly was 21. Her wedding dress was made by her mother from a curtain at the Arch Street Theater in Philadelphia. <laughs> Yonkel's attire was a costume from a play in which he had appeared in London. Jacob Yonkel Kalish was instrumental in Molly's rise to stardom on the Yiddish stage in New York City on 2nd Avenue. He felt that in order for her to break into the Yiddish big time, she would have to already be an established star. He also felt she was too American, that she didn't really know enough about the characters she was portraying. Consequently, they went to Europe so Molly could steep herself in European culture. She and Jacob went to see all the great actors of the European stage so Molly could learn. Also, during this time, she wrote, he wrote shows for Molly in which she toured, perfecting her style. I was uh, just kind of YouTubing with my stepdaughter the other day, and we found this interview of, like in 1980, of uh, Molly Pecan being interviewed by uh, Merv Griffin. And he said, were you ever in a flop? And she said, oh, so many. <laughs> so I have a feeling a lot of those happened during this period. Uh, let's see, let's see. Okay. In 1924, they returned to America, to New York, to Second Avenue. Yiddish theater was in its heyday at the time. Jacob approached the manager of the Second Avenue Theater, a man named Edelstein. Jacob tried to convince him that he needed the great European actress, Molly Piecon. <laughs> As Molly tells the story, Edelstein took one look at me and walked. Look at the size of her. You would need a magnifying glass to see her on stage. <laughs> now, the play in which Molly starred most in Europe was called Yankele. 
a Jewish Peter Pan. In it, she played a 13-year-old boy, so her size wasn't that important. Edelstein still objected, so Jacob shooed him, showed him the, <laughs> it was typing late, this is what happened. So Jacob showed him the reviews of Yankele. He was still unsure when a lucky thing happened. The famous Yiddish theater composer Joseph Wolchinsky came by. He felt that Molly should have a chance to prove what she could do. It was Romschinsky who persuaded Edelstein, the manager, to put on the play for one weekend. If it flopped, no contract. Well, they ended up staying at the Second Avenue Theater for 10 years. <laughs> Edelstein also said that Pie Kuhn was too long a name. So he and Jacob decided to shorten it to Pecan. Molly said that she's gotten letters addressed to Pipkin, <laughs> Picnic, <laughs> Pipic, <laughs> which means Bailey Letter, and Walnut. <laughs> a last from a man who remembered that she was some kind of nut. <laughs> <laughs> After four years, Molly and Jacob took over the Second Avenue Theater. They remained there for the next six years. Now, after Yankalek closed, the next show they did was Oyez du Sameru, Oyez du Girl. And over the next 10 years, Molly appeared in 34 more musicals, all written by Jacob Kalish and Joseph Wyszynski. Many of the styles of traditional operettas were adapted for the Yiddish theater. Here we go again, hopping for our own purposes. One such stylized song composed by Joseph Rumshinsky with lyrics by Molly was Dus Tsiganak Mädel or The Gypsy Girl, written for the show of the same name in 1925. In this piece, Molly sings of her undying love for her man. But if she should look twice at another girl, she'd kill him. And then do a sad dance. I hope she had a Fleischer messer. <laughs> <laughs> So here's Tsigai Nekmei by Joseph Ruszynski and Molly Pico. Ready? Ready. <laughs> Doesn't want to work, and I always wonder if 
This character was taken from her real father. The two older brother uh, and sister are out doing their thing. They're working, they're having a good time. So Molly is left to take care of the two younger kids. And they call her Mama Bay, which means little mother. And this song, called Mazel, which means luck, happens to be a song that my grandmother sang to me when I was a kid. I never thought I'd be using all these things. And um, it says, luck, you come to everybody else's door. And you go through the door. And you go into their homes. But look, when you come to my house, you stay at the threshold. was considered the big time by all performers, not just Jewish ones, uptown and downtown, north of uh, 14th Street and below 14th Street in the town. Molly received $2,500 a week, so that's still good money. You could, you could almost rent an apartment in, uh, in San Francisco for that. <laughs> I'm going to get a Unfortunately, there's no booze in this. It's a little earlier. Yeah. 
Hard to don't put on the pants just because I get excited here. <laughs> it's happened in the past that I do get excited. Love 
is in the pit orchestra. She sees him there and she says, Yeah, I'm not an angel. I got him think that. And he looks at her, and of course they fall in love and they get married on a boat that I to America. So it has a wonderful happy ending. But during the uh, during their travels, she realizes that she's in love with him. And she says, Oh mama, we never found me. Mama, I mean, this is before you know, they get on the boat. They meet. She's in love with him and she sings, Oi, Mama, I've been in I'm in love with the boy who plays the violin. He's always on my mind. I love him so much. I want to embrace the whole world. Now, this particular song is what I call kind of a crossover song because the Andrew sisters, sorry, Barry, Barry sisters. I can't remember if it was Andy or Barry. Thank you. Made an English version of this, the lyrics of which have nothing to do with the original song, sort of a, a union song. So here's Oi Mama, Bin Oh no, I'm sorry, I've talked about it, but I didn't say here's Little Men for the first.
1938, she starred in the film version of Mama Lynn, which I just told you about. Also directed by Joseph Green, together with Yiddle Mitten Fiddle, these movies reveal the lives right before the Holocaust of the Jews. The next song is from Mama Lynn. It's called Ich Zing, which means I sing. This was written for the male lead in the movie. I just happen to like it so much that I'm going to sing it for you. And when we talk about musical progression, this can go right into heart and soul. <laughs> and this is the guy that she has fallen in love with. There, there's a courtyard. And he is in an apartment across the courtyard. And he is looking at her. And he falls in love with her. And she falls in love with him. And eventually, they get together. But meanwhile, they're just pining for each other. Later, Molly toured in Europe, 
South Africa, and South America. And one of the rhythms commonly used in South America is the tango. We're going to play a little rhythm so you can recognize it. in a production called Engel and Leyden, Once in a Lifetime. Now, listen for the South American influence. Before we do that, there was one thing I remembered. In the, in the off-season, the Yiddish theater people would go down to South America because they needed to work. So when the theaters were closed in New York, they went to South America, and as we do, we hop rhythms, we hop melodies. We grab them and we use them. So here is Eugen. Your dazzling, compelling eyes have attracted my heart. No longer am I depressed as I respond to the allure of your ecstatic, dark eyes. It's like the Ochichornia <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. 
don't tell us. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. It says turn back. Turn back the clock. Turn back. Listen. I wish. I wish I could. I think you've turned it too far. I have turned it too far. <laughs> Aha! That it? got stuck between the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> it's like between the. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I think you talked about that yesterday, right? Between the hole and the, the hole and the sheet. Okay. <laughs> I grew up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which was an Orthodox neighborhood. Now it's very expensive. <laughs> but I used to go uh, to school and I would see the rabbi with the ten little yarmulkes all in a row. <laughs> so that was what was happening between the sheets. <laughs> in 1946, Molly visited the displaced persons camps in Europe. Years later, in an interview, she recalled that a woman came up with a child and said, my child is two years old and she has never heard the sound of laughter. Her husband then told her, Molly, that's our job, make them laugh. She also visited Korea and Japan in 1951. In 1959, she starred in The Kosher Widow in New York. And I have a vague memory of my mother dragging me there when I was a little kid. And I had no idea what was going on. And she said, you will never see this again. So now when I think back on it, I was very glad that she, she did that. And I kept falling asleep. up. OK. So she started The Kosher Widow in New York. And in 1960, in the London production of A Majority of One, co-starring Robert Morley. That was remade with um, Rosalind Russell, sort of like an, an inter, interfaith, interracial marriage. Yeah. Back on Broadway, she scored a success in the musical Milk and Honey in 1961, which talked about the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, here's the theme song from that show. If you know any of these and you want to sing along, this is the land of milk and honey. This is the land of sun and song. And this is a world of good and plenty. Is out. And I think 
In this Merv Griffin interview, this is one of the flops she was talking about. We couldn't find anything about it. So I'm putting that together. Parts is out and the play was out too. And in 1977, Molly starred in Something Old, Something New with Hans Conry. This later was called The Second Time Around. And it was made into a musical. Molly's later films included Come Blow Your Horn with Frank Sinatra. She played a mother, a Jewish mother. For Pete's Sake with Barbara Streisand, and of course as Yentl, Fiddler on the Roof. When I was first starting to learn Yiddish so that I could sing in it authentically, other than transliteration, I met a woman who was helped me learn Yiddish, she taught me Yiddish, and she had been on the stage as a young girl. And at one point, she was in a theater in New Jersey with Molly Pecan and waiting to go in the wings. She was ahead of Molly, because Molly was the headliner, and she tripped on her dress. And Molly came over to her and said, don't worry, that happens to me all the time. So she was a mensch, you know, she made this young woman feel, feel better. And one time I was just kind of scrolling through the TV, and there was a movie on called The Naked City. And I'm watching and watching, you know. There's a short scene where this woman is selling root beer on the street. It was Molly Peacock. She, I don't think she was billed in the movie. But I was like, and I was like, what? And there was Molly selling root beer. Molly and Jacob had no children. She had a premature daughter that was stillborn. They never had kids. Molly died in her sleep at the home of her sister, Helen Silverblatt, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, on April 7, 1992. She was 94, but her theme song, Abi Gesund, or as Molly would have said, Abi Gesund, I'll let you know, not yet, was, has kept her eternally and then we'll see a clip of Molly singing a big event.
Uh, if you want to take a look at Molly's letter, go ahead. But no, touching. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, can I just uh, confirm it? If he's, if you believe Rabbi Wikipedia, <laughs> then the, the lineage is that Michael Tilson uh, Thomas, oh, yes, Thomas, Thomas, Thomas is actually the grandfather. And, and I thought uh, grandson. Grandson. Okay. And that's what was in his stage, uh, in his uh, orchestral play. I shame it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember that. Okay, so I appreciate that. Let's. Um, and watch. And if you listen, there's different words that she's singing here, which, uh, which have to do with what she's actually doing in the show. Thank you. 